Zork is one of the earliest interactive fiction computer games, with roots drawn from the original genre game of Colossal Cave Adventure. The first version of Zork was written in 1977-1979 using the MDL programming language on a DEC PDP-10 computer. The authors, Tim Anderson, Mark Blank, Bruce Daniels, and Dave Leveling, were members of the MIT Dynamic Modeling Group. When Zork was published commercially, it was split up into three games. Zork, The Great Underground Empire, Part 1, Zork 2, The Wizard of Frobos, and Zork 3, The Dungeon Master. Zork distinguished itself in its genre as an especially rich game, in terms of both the quality of the storytelling and the sophistication of its text parser, which was not limited to simple verb-noun commands but recognized sim prepositions and conjunctions. Story Setting Zork is set in the ruins of an ancient empire lying far underground. The player is a nameless adventurer who is venturing into this dangerous land in search of wealth and adventure. The goal is to return from exploring the great underground empire alive and with all treasures needed to complete each adventure, ultimately inheriting the title of Dungeon Master. The dungeons are stocked with many novel creatures, objects, and locations, among them, the ferocious but light-fearing Groose, Zork Mids, and Flood Control Dam No. 3, all of which are referenced by subsequent Infocom text adventures. Frobosco International is a fictional monopolist conglomerate from the game. Frobosco products are littered throughout all Zork games, often to humorous effect. Several treasures and locations in Zork suggest that there used to be a large aristocratic family called the Flatheads, who had 12 kings. Some Flatheads are named after historical figures, for example, in Zork 2, one treasure is a portrait of J. Pierpont Flathead. In each game, there are several light sources the player can pick up and use, among them a battery-powered brass lantern and a pair of candles which both have a limited lifespan, as well as a torch that never expires. The player must be carrying at least one light source at all times when exploring the dark areas of the games, or else, if he or she continues navigating through the dark, the player will be caught and devoured by a carnivorous Gru, ending the adventure in defeat. The exception to this rule occurs when the player must use a spray can of Gru repellent to navigate dark areas requiring an empty inventory in order to traverse. Plot The original MIT version of Zork combines plot elements from all three of the following games, which were made available for commercial sale. Zork I The Great Underground Empire The game takes place in the Zork calendar year 948 Gu. The player steps into the deliberately vague role of an adventurer. The game begins near a White House in a small, self-contained area. Although the player is given little instruction, the house provides an obvious point of interest. When the player enters the house, it yields a number of intriguing objects, including a brass battery-powered lantern, an empty trophy case, and an elvish sword of great antiquity. Beneath the rug a trapdoor leads down into a dark cellar, which is revealed to be one of several entrances to a vast subterranean land known as the Great Underground Empire. The player soon encounters dangerous creatures, including deadly groups who only prey on their victims in the dark, an axe-wielding troll, a giant cyclops who powers at the mention of Odysseus and a nimble-fingered thief who makes mapping the maze difficult by removing or scattering any items that the player might drop to leave a trail. The ultimate goal of Zorkai is to collect the 20 treasures of Zork and install them in the trophy case. Finding the treasures requires solving a variety of puzzles such as the navigation of two complex mazes and some intricate manipulations at Flood. Control Dam No. 3 Placing all of the treasures into the trophy case scores the player 350 points and grants the rank of Master Adventurer, an ancient map with further instructions then magically appears in the trophy case. These instructions provide access to a stone barrow. The entrance to the barrow is the end of Zork I and the beginning of Zork II. 
There are 28 ways for the player to die. It is possible to score all 350 points in 223 moves by exploiting a bug. Zork 2. The Wizard of Frobos The player begins in the barrow from Zork I armed only with the trusty brass lantern and the elvish sword of great antiquity. From before, the purpose of the game is not initially clear. The Wizard of Frobos is soon introduced. The wizard was once a respected enchanter, but when his powers began to fade he was exiled by Lord Dimwit Flathead. Now bordering on senility, the wizard is still a force to be reckoned with. The player's goal in the wizard's realm is to avoid his capricious tricks and to learn to control his magic. Zork 2 is notable for two notoriously difficult puzzles. The bank puzzle, in which the player must figure out how to walk through several bank walls in order to figure out how to get out of bank with the loot from the vault, without tripping the security alarm, and the oddly angled room. A diamond-shaped room filed with panes of glass representing baseball bases. The player must figure out how to traverse the diamond in order to open a door that will lead to the game's finale. Like its predecessor, Zork 2 is essentially a treasure hunt. Unlike the previous game of the ten treasures are tied together by a crude plot. Finding the treasures does not end the game, nor are all the treasures needed to finish the game. Instead, the adventurer must figure out a way to use the treasures in order to reach the game's finale. Zork 3 The Dungeon Master The player begins at the bottom of the endless stair from Zork 2. Zork 3 is somewhat less of a straightforward treasure hunt than previous installments. Instead, the player, in the role of the same adventurer played in Zork I and Zork 2, must demonstrate worthiness to assume the role of the Dungeon Master. The player must get past the Guardians of Zork with the complete garb of the Dungeon Master and then endure a final test. The player must be wearing the amulet, the cloak and hood, the staff, the strange key to get past the dark places, the royal ring, and the black book. Unlike Zork I and Zork II there is a time-sensitive event, an earthquake which is randomly triggered about 130 turns into gameplay. The player must retrieve the key before the earthquake and can't complete the royal puzzle or retrieve the ring until after the earthquake. Also unlike the previous two Zork games, the lantern is of little relevance. It is needed only to walk through the dark areas of the junction, creepy crawl and foggy room at the beginning of the game. Another light source, the torch from the scenic vista, is used to retrieve the repellent from Zork 2 and deposit it in the damp passage via the teleportation table to provide a light source for the return journey after retrieving the key. Once the player has all the items, they must give the way bread to the elderly man in the engravings room who reveals himself as the dungeon master once fed to find the doorway leading to the final hallway. Here the elvish sword of great antiquity is used to block the beam in the beam room. Next the adventurer must get through the guardians of Zork. This can either be accomplished by using the complicated mirror box or by simply drinking the invisibility potion in the vial from the flathead ocean. When the player knocks on the Dungeon Master's door he will only open it if the player is fully equipped. He then tells the adventurer that he will obey their commands and follow them to help solve the final puzzle. The corridors lead to a parapet which overlooks the fiery cells. Reading the book here reveals a map of the dungeon and treasury of Zork, which has eight cells, one of which with the bronze door that leads to the treasury of Zork. The eight positions of the dial in the parapet correspond to the eight cells. The adventurer must use trial and error at this point to summon the cell with the bronze door and have the dungeon master return it to its original position by replacing it with any other cell. The key will now unlock the door revealing the treasury of Zork, which contains the wealth of the great underground empire as well as a controlling share in Frobosco International. After this victorious discovery, the dungeon master appears and transforms the player into a duplicate of himself, signifying the player's succession to his position. Commands In the Zork games, the player is not limited to verb-noun commands, such as take lamp, open mailbox, and so forth. 
Instead, the parser supports more sophisticated sentences such as, put the lamp and sword in the case, look under the rug, and drop all except lantern. The game understands many common verbs, including, take, drop, examine, attack, climb, open, close, count, and many more. The games also support commands to the game directly such as save and restore, script and unscript, restart and quit. Development Colossal Cave The first adventure game, Colossal Cave Adventure, had been written by Will Crowther in Fortran on the deck PDP-10 at BBN in 1975. Colossal Cave was a basic treasure hunt that took place in an analogue of Mammoth Cave. The game used a simple two-word parser that became a common staple of later games in the genre. The game was quickly copied around the PDP community, where it was found on the Stanford University machine by Don Woods in 1976. Woods contacted Crowther and received his blessing to make an improved version. This was soon found on many machines, including the PDP-10 at MIT. Zork and Dungeon Colossal Cave reached MIT some time in 1977, where it was seen by the Zork programmers. They decided to write a greatly updated version of the same basic in MDL on their PDP-10 running the ITS operating system. Muddle was a LISP-based system that provided powerful string manipulation. So while the two games were similar in that they used text commands for input and were essentially based on exploration, Zork was much more advanced technically, allowing longer and more specific commands. Zork also used a completely new map that was designed in multiple areas with their own stories and self-contained puzzles, whereas Cave was purely exploratory. While Colossal Cave has been referred to as a simulation of Mammoth Cave, Zork has been referred to as a simulation of Colossal Cave. By the summer of 1977 the game was runnable, although only about one half its final 1 megabyte size. The team, now referring to themselves as the Imps, continued to add new sections to the map throughout the summer. The game initially ran only on its, but a port of Muddle to TENEX was available, which they further adapted to run on TOPS 20 after they were granted an account on a machine running it. This version was made widely available as users copied it about the early ARPANET, and a mailing list dedicated to the game soon appeared. Over the fall the final sections of the game were added, along with the D&D-inspired combat system, and the game was essentially complete. The imps continued working on the game over the next year, adding further areas and puzzles, with major development completed by the fall of 1978. The last edition was not made until February 1979, but development continued on bug fixes and touch-ups. With the last mainframe release in January 1981, the word Zork is a nonsense word, often used by MIT Hacker as the name for any unfinished program until they were ready to be installed on the system. With the game complete, in 1978 the team renamed the game Dungeon. By this time the game was already quite popular and becoming relatively well known in gaming circles. Sometime in 1978 the developers received notice from Tactical Studies Rules, the publishers of Dungeons & Dragons, who claimed the game violated their copyrights. To avoid any legal wrangling, they changed the name back to Zork, Fortran port while being developed at DM. The game's source code was protected by encrypting the files and patching the machine's copy of its to not allow access to the directory containing the source code. One enterprising MIT hacker was able to re-patch the OS to allow access to the directory. He copied the source directory to a TOPS20 machine and began trying every possible password until the files were readable. Bob Supnik, a programmer from Digital Equipment Corporation, used the decrypted source to create a Fortran IV port, which allowed the game to run on the smaller PDP-11. Bob released his version in January 1978. As Fortran compilers were available on practically every computer of the era, new versions were soon available on many platforms. 
The source for these versions were taken in the era when the original game was still known as Dungeon, and they all retained this name as they were ported about. For this reason, through 1978 the game was known under both names, and versions with the Dungeon name remained for years. The Fortran version of Dungeon was widely available on deck vaxes, being one of the most popular items distributed by DEC US. It went through multiple modifications both to incorporate more features from the original and to track changes in the MDL version. In the late 1980s, the Fortran version was extensively rewritten for Vax Fortran and became fully compatible with the last MDL release. It had Y extra joke, an apparent entrance to the mill that was, in fact, impassable. It also had a GDT command which enabled the player to move any object to any room. Use a GDT required answering a random question requiring deep knowledge of the game. The game's response to a wrong answer appears in many fortune cookie databases. The Fortran version was also included in the distribution media for some data general operating systems. It was used as an acceptance test to verify that the OS had been correctly installed. Being able to compile, link, and run the program demonstrated that all of the runtime libraries, compiler, and link editor were installed in the correct locations. Infocom forms in 1979 three of the four original imps founded Infocom as a general programming firm. Two other members of the DM team, Joel Beres and Mark Blank, had both moved to Pittsburgh and kept in touch, considering the future of Zork. When they heard of the formation of Infocom, they contacted them and convinced him it was possible to sell Zork commercially on the emerging home computer platforms. However, these systems generally did not have a Fortran compiler, and definitely not MDL, and used floppy disk systems storing around 180 kilobytes, or even using cassette tapes for storage. To solve the language problem, Beres and Blank came up with the idea of having their own computer programming language known as Zork Implementation Language, or ZIL, which would run within a virtual machine known as the Z Machine. The Z Machine would be ported to various platforms in shells known as the Z Machine Interpreter Program, or ZIP. Using rented time on a TOPS 20 machine, they built the first ZIP during 1979. To solve the problem of storage space, they first considered using data compression, and later decided to simply remove sections of the game until it would fit on a floppy disk. Dave Lebeling drew a circle on the Zorp map so it contained about half of the original map. About 100 or so locations including everything above ground and a large section surrounding the round room. The rest would be used for future versions. The map was modified in a number of places to clean it up and make it more logical, as well as sealing off locations that formerly led to areas of the map that were now being left out. Beres and Blank moved back to Boston, and Beres became the president of the company. The new game was running on TOPS 20 Zip and a new PDP-11 version of the Z machine by the end of 1979. They then purchased a TRS-80, where Scott Cutler brought up a Zip early in 1980. The team began looking for ways to market the game and turn to personal software. The distributors of Isacalc and likely the first software distribution firm for Micros. They demonstrated Zork in February, an agreement was arranged in June, and sales began in December. Sales Begin PS had no interest in the PDP-11 version, so Infocom retained the distribution rights. This became the first official sale for Infocom in November 1980, when a copy was shipped out on 8-inch floppy along with a hand-copied version of the manual. Sales of the TRS-80 version though PS followed the next month, selling 1,500 copies over the next nine months. Bruce Daniels' Apple II version began sales in February 1981 and PS sold 6,000 copies by September. 
As soon as Zork began shipping, Lebeling began converting the remaining half of the map to ZIL. However, this was eventually broken into two parts, both modified from the original, to be released as Zork 2 and Zork 3. While Zork I is very similar to the first half of the original game, the sequels are very different from the second half, for example, in 2 the player cannot return to the White House. Zork 2 was offered to PS in April and licensed in June 1981, but by this time Infocom had grown concerned about PS's commitment to the game, although Infocom was not privy to this fact. Sales of Visicalc were so strong that PS was starting the process of dropping other titles and becoming Visicorp. Infocom took over distribution in October and set up their own supply chain, releasing both the renamed Zork I and Zork II in November 1981. Through 1982 the company completed the port of Zork III while also writing new zips for Commodore 64, the Commodore Plus 4, the Atari 8-bit family the CPM systems, and the IBM PC. The entire line was released on these platforms when Zork 3 shipped in the fall of 1982. Later ports when Zork became a commercial product at Infocom, Infocom agreed that if an Infocom copyright notice was put on the Fortran version, non-commercial distribution would be allowed. This Fortran version, and C translations thereof, have been included in several Linux distributions.